You probably heard of recent Google and then IBM quantum supremacy. All of these quantum computers are based on the same superconducting qubit. However, today I would like to discuss an entirely different approach to building quantum computers. It is so-called silicon qubits or they also called silicon quantum dots. It is actually a paradigm shift. Just imagine chips similar to those in our phones or laptops to perform quantum computing. This technology will enable a 1 million qubit quantum computer of a small size, the one which can actually fit in our pocket. This is so exciting. And today I will be featuring a very special guest, Dr. Stefano Pilerano, who is one of the tech leaders of Interlabs working on silicon qubits. You probably know uh, the qubit is basically the quantum equivalent of a, the classical bit that you have in classical computers. So, but the very key difference, uh, very, very fascinating, is that you know, the classical bit can only be in uh, one of two states, either zero or one. It's like a, it's like a switch. Uh, but the qubit uh, can be in superpositional state, so which means that it can be like zero and one at the same time. And this is one of the aspects uh, that makes uh, quantum computing so powerful to uh, address uh, some very specific problems. And there are multiple approaches to building a qubit. The most popular, as well as the most mature right now, is superconducting qubit. This approach is pursued by companies like Google and IBM and a bunch of other startups like, for instance, CatQubit, CatQubit, CatQubit. And depending on how many qubits they are able to entangle, applications becoming more and more relevant. With just 50 entangled qubits, you have already more states than any classical supercomputer. Means you reached quantum supremacy. When you have 300 qubits, you get already more states than atoms in the whole universe. And let's say with 1 million qubits, you can do already things like cryptography and even magic. To me, the most important question is, are we alone? And I have a feeling that quantum computers, as they mature, are going to help us answer that question. Now, what is wrong with a classical superconducting qubit? This type of qubit is relatively large, and it also needs a simulation and a readout interface, so it's lots of wires. Here is a setup by Google, which was used to control just 50 qubits. This is obviously very challenging to scale. But the problem is that to be able to actually solve useful problem, uh, we really need to scale the system to a very large number of qubits, like not uh, not the tens, not the hundreds, but actually millions. So it's very important to uh, to target the qubit technology that can actually scale to this number. And so when you look at uh, the silicon-based qubits, uh, they are very similar to transistors. And then again, the key point is that this is a qubit technology that can leverage all the uh, lithographic process, the advancement in scaling, and uh, all the experience that we've gained uh, in the semiconductor industry to push it forward. Silicon quantum dot technology allows the highest degree of integration. And as name suggests, it's based on silicon, so on our traditional CMOS technology. This means you can integrate millions of qubits on a single chip. How does it sound? Qubits are fragile. So due to some noise or measurement, it can collapse back to the classical state. That's why we still need cooling here, because at 20 mK at which quantum chip operates, the thermal noise is very, very low. Actually, losing this state is not a problem, because you can read out this state pretty fast, but the error is the problem. So there is a lot of work and research ongoing to develop the error correction algorithm for quantum dots. They use millions of qubits, and some of them perform the same operation. And based on that, they will be correcting the error. Now, how quantum dot looks like? When you look at this pin qubit, it is basically like a transistor. Uh, now. How do you implement a qubit? You know, you can do it in, in, in many different ways. And basically all you need is, um, is a system uh, that has basically two different energy levels. 
each one corresponding to say the zero and one. But the system has to be such that it behaves in a, in a quantum mechanical way. And so one an example of silicon qubit is the spin qubit. So this is basically is a, a single electron transistor. So you, you encode the qubit state in the spin of one single electron, and this electron is effectively trapped within a single electron transistor. And so, you know, now you can imagine that how small a single spin qubit can be is basically as small as the smallest transistor that you can make. So if you have a great process technology and a very advanced lithography process, you can make a lot of them in a very small volume or area. Now, let's say we have quantum dots built out of transistors. But how do we control this silicon qubits? And that's true. That's the part that I love, actually. Yes, that's true. <laughs> so let me try to explain this. So, uh, for example, uh, the state of a, of a spin qubit uh, can be manipulated uh, using uh, radio frequency pulses. And this has to be sent to the specific resonant frequency of the qubit. It's like you're trying to uh, resonate some, like a musical instrument. And so, in the end, when you look at the circuit that is needed to manipulate the qubit state, it, it looks like a wireless transmitter. So what you have to do is you have to generate this pulse uh, at a specific frequency with a, a, an arbitrary envelope or shape. And these shapes, the form of the, of, the, of the pulse, actually represent the instruction that you want to implement on the quantum computer. So different shapes are different instructions for your computers. For this, Intel has built a horse reach SOC to control these qubits. It is fabricated using Intel's FinFAT 22 nanometers technology. So our fridge has been designed to operate at 4 Kelvin in the, in the fridge. And why this is important? Uh, because now all the, all the very high precision analog signals that are needed to, as we, as we saw before, to control and read the qubit, now can be generated directly inside the dilution refrigerator, you know, just like, you know, this is the actual setup of our switch behind me. Um, near the qubit chip. And so this greatly simplify all the signals that have to go basically in and out of the fridge. While our fridge sits at 4 Kelvin in the fridge today, the qubit chip for now is actually at colder temperature in the millikelvin range. Mm. So they are not currently co-packaged. And so when you look at where we are today, still the interface between the cryogenic plate at 4 Kelvin where our fridge sits and the qubit chip that sits at millikelvin, it's still, um, it's still very challenging because this is still based on cables. And so it, it's very challenging to scale. So we really need to push integration further. And so as you mentioned, similarly to other university and industry, we're also been looking at these hot qubits. And so this promise to operate at higher temperature, say in the order of one Kelvin. And so then once you achieve this, now you can think of putting the, the controller chip and the qubit chip maybe on the same package. And so now your interface between the control and the qubit is not based on cables, but is based on packaging high density interconnect. And so this is key to scale to very large number of qubits. And it's also very interesting for us because as you know, Intel has a very advanced packaging technologies mm -hmm. that can be actually leveraged for this application. Now, if you want to push things further, so we like to dream, and this is uh, you know, the holy grail of the, of the integration, um, it would be to integrate the qubits and the electronics to control the qubits on the same die. And this would create what you've called, the, you know, the quantum SOC. And also, I asked Stefano a couple more philosophical questions about the future of quantum computing. I hope you will enjoy it. Do you think at some point of time we will come to quantum computer with reasonable cooling, so no liquid nitrogen? or even at, let's say, room temperature or something like 300 Kelvin. Yes, yes, of course, you know, when uh, when people see the way this, uh, this uh, experimental setup are, you know, it's, a, it's fascinating, but of course, you know, it's not something you can keep in your pocket, right? <laughs> um, so it's very difficult to answer these questions, of course. Uh, but what, uh, what I like to do is I like to look at, uh, at history of what uh, the, the transistor process technology and integration can actually do. So, you know, you look at back like in the mid 70s and we had the uh, Cray-1, right? The first uh, commercial supercomputer. And, and that, that was a beast, you know, it weighed more than five tons and they had freon refrigeration. If you uh, compare to what would cost today, it would be about like $30 million. So 
big, big, uh, impressive engineering achievement. But then after 50 years, you look at today, we have phones in the pockets, in our pockets that are like already 10 times more powerful at a very small fraction of the cost and, and the volume. So, so in the end, you know, uh, no, I would not say that it's not possible. And, you know, I'm looking forward to be, to be part of this uh, engineering challenge. Silicon quantum dots seems to be one of the most prominent approaches to quantum computing. But not only Intel is taking this approach. There is a couple of exciting startups out there working in the same direction. For instance, there is a Quantum Motion UK-based startup. These guys are also working on building a quantum computer based on electron spins. They have a similar vision as Intel. So they want to leverage standard CMOS technology to build a scalable quantum computer. Then there is an equal one startup. I do not know if you've heard of it yet. It's a cool one. They're also working on CMOS based quantum computer, but this one is specifically tailored for AI. The thing is, quantum based system is inherently, by its nature, looking at multiple complementary states simultaneously. And that's the reason why it is considered to be much more natural hardware to be used for AI, in contrast to traditional digital chips for AI. Equal One already fabricated a prototype chip where they are integrating a quantum neural network with control electronic on a single chip. Now they target to scale it up to more qubits, to run even larger neural networks on it. What is your opinion is the bottleneck of the modern quantum computing? Is this software? Is it hardware? Is it algas? What do you think? So uh, it's, a, it, it's a complicated um, problem, of course. And, uh, and as you probably know, at Intel, we're looking at uh, the full stack. So we're, we're looking, starting from the bottom, where the quantum device sits all the way up to the computer architecture, the software and the algorithms. And I think this is very important to have a, a quantum program that covers the full stack. Um, however, I think that today the main bottleneck probably comes from the hardware. So because, you know, even if we are able to produce millions of qubits, of good qubits, right, you still have the wiring and you still have to interconnect all of them and you still have to bring all these signals uh, for control and readout. And this is a really big scaling channel. And in the end, it's not even all about the number of qubits, right? Uh, I like to say that, you know, having good qubits without actually solving the, the, the bottleneck of uh, interconnect would be like, uh, you know, driving a Formula One car while stuck in traffic, right? So, <laughs> no, so, so in the end, what's our strategy? Well, uh, first of all, as I said, we believe that by leveraging the silicon base, the qubits, we can actually benefit from our 50 years experience in the semiconductor industry, right? And then the cryogenic electronics, we, with that, we can address the interconnect scaling bottleneck. And so by combining these two, we will be able to deliver quantum computers that as they have millions of qubits. And so we can finally use this to solve the reusable problems that eventually will really change our lives. I think quantum computing will make for us many surprises this century and it will be definitely fun to watch but we for sure have to keep an eye on silicon quantum dots this approach has enormous potential in case you want to support me creating these videos the link to the patreon is in the description below now you may like to check out another video on my channel about radiation hardened chips so basically chips which go to the space chips beyond the earth so basically this is one of my favorite videos on my channel so i will link it here make sure to check it out later and yes if you want me to cover a particular topic on this channel leave me a comment below i definitely need more ideas for future videos anyway i hope you enjoyed my train of thoughts and special thank you to Dr. Stefano Belrano for his interesting and exciting insights on silicon-based quantum computers. And I will see you in the next video. Ciao!